Welcome from, from my side and from ITEMIS. So my name is Klaus Birken, I'm from ITEMIS Stuttgart. Actually I'm with ITEMIS since uh, seven years now, so it's quite a while. Um, thanks to JetBrains for all the organization here. I think it's fine, we, we have everything we need. Coffee, drinks and even a restaurant tip for, for this evening. Okay, so I will, I will talk about uh, security and safety today. So, um, these are two applications we are using MPS for, and the idea of the talk is that I, I show a, a span across various dimensions. So one is a product, the, the other is a research prototype, one is, a, uh, is for end users, which are not programmers, the other is for, for developers, and so on. So there are various dimensions which we will look at, but we will also uh, um, see a, a fair share of security and safety information. So it's not all about MPS on every slide. I also won't show the, my generators here. Maybe some of you will do later in the talks. But I will, I will just focus on the application. Okay, let's start with an overview. So I will, I, the, the talk will have four sections. And the two middle ones will be the big ones. At first I will talk about security and safety briefly and uh, motivate what we are doing there and then I will talk maybe 20 minutes about security and um, the remaining part about functional safety and there will be a short summary at the end. So this is a, 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 a typical website uh, regarding automotive uh, security. So there are lots of, of websites how to hack a car there are also nice videos where someone is driving and someone from, from an office anywhere else in the world can, can stop the motor or, or switch off the brakes and so on. Um, and there is also this nice GitHub site where you find all the resources you need for hacking cars. So th this is a typical uh, security topic, but it's not only about uh, cars, so it's all kind of transportation but also IT systems, so breaches of credit cards and so on. So there, you probably heard about Stuxnet and all these kind of viruses. So this is what we want to avoid. Um, the definition from, from Wikipedia, and so it basically says what we all know already, so it's about the protection of computer systems from theft or damage. Yeah, so these are the, the, dif the difficult things and everything which can go wrong will go wrong at one point. Um, the, the nice thing here is that when you look for security experts, you probably get some people with, with guns and helmets. So uh, this is why it's always called IT security or cyber security. We don't want the whole uh, security uh, area. Now, um, this is a similar slide talking about safety. And in safety, so this is a nice paper about the role of software in recent catastrophic accidents and they review 15 catastrophic accidents and how software um, provided a reason for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. This is also very important in transportation, automotive, aerospace and so on and this is uh, quite famous since, since decades. Um, but now it's getting a new drive because of this cooperation in, in the, of robots and, and uh, workers in the industry space. So if you do something like this, so someone is working with, them, uh, with a robot in close interaction, then it's, it's clear that if something's wrong with the software, then people will be injured. And this is what, what we want to avoid in the safety space. This is a definition from TÜV Süd in Germany. So I, I'm able to use the umlauts here, which is quite nice, so most of you will know. And uh, so this definition just uh, defines functional safety in terms of overall safety. Because safety is a quite common concept, and what we are talking about here is functional safety. So system or piece of equipment should operate correctly even if the operator does something weird, or the hardware fails, or the software fails. So we have to think about measures how to make it safe, despite of everything could go wrong. Now what is the relationship between safety and security? So if you look at safety, then 
you have only this dimension of nobody should die or get injured, right? And if you look at privacy, which is yet another concept, it's so personal data should not be violated, not be breached. But security is a bit more complex because we, we not only have this overlap with safety and privacy, uh, we also have some other dimensions like cost and also quality measures. So if your car gets hacked and the maximum speed suddenly is 20 kilometers an hour, then probably this is even, even better for safety. But for security, it's, it's bad. Now this is another interesting thing. Many languages in the world are using the same term for both. Like in, in Germany, it's uh, Sicherheit. And in, in Dutch, uh, it's Veiligheid. I, I trained this very long yesterday night. <laughs> um, then there are other languages. But in, this is nice in, in, in English, it's, it's different terms. And this is why I'm glad I can give this talk in English, because otherwise I always have to explain when I use Veiligheid. I used it again. Okay, but uh, so what you can remember about the difference of both is safety is about preventing harm due to unintentional actions. Some things happening with statistical probability, and then once something bad happens, the damage. And security is intentional action. So somewhere there's a, some some guy who wants to break into the system. And there are conflicts between both. I already mentioned this thing with the car, so safety wants to shut the system down, but security wants to prevent it. Yeah. Um, and also security likes passwords, but if you are on a system which should be safe and something happens and it says, I want to enter emergency mode, please enter password. This is probably not the right thing to do. Okay. And, and now let's, uh, this is the, I think the final slide of this motivation section. Um, both of these disciplines, security and functional safety, can be, can be tackled on two levels. One level is analyzing the system and thinking about the measures, which is the line on top. Yeah. So you don't do actually uh, implement measures, but you, you're looking at the system and think about what should I do to make it safe or to make it secure. This is the, the top line. And, and there are analysis techniques for this. Uh, we will see some of them later. And on implementation level, you have an actual system and then you try to break in or you, you change the code to make it more safe or more secure. And in this talk, I will talk about this uh, um, square, which is about a, a product for analyzing security. And I will talk about this, which is uh, implementation level measures for achieving safety. Or for, Improving the safety of the system. So the, the gist of this talk is to show how MPS can be used for this. On the one hand, for for building a product which allows to analyze security aspects of systems and find me measures, and on the other hand, for implementing functional safety code into actual code or models. And this should show the, the bandwidth of MPS possibilities. So I already mentioned these dimensions from end-user RCP product to research platform, from non-developer users to developers, and also the, uh, regarding the, the domain abstraction level. So are we looking at a system model or at detailed program code? Okay, so now let's uh, dive into the first big part, which is um, security analysis. So what we are doing since... Um, 2016, early 2016, is building a product for analyzing the security of systems and finding measures to improve it. This is not doing penetration tests and it's not massaging the code to make the system more secure, but it's just about analyzing because this is always the first step when you design a system, you look at its security. It will have after you have implemented. And currently our focus is on automotive, which is mentioned on this slide, because um, there's a whole set of best practices and norms in each of the domains, and so we have to focus a little bit on one of the domains to actually address the, the problems of the users. 
Um, the, the whole cooperation started by, by work together with Fraunhofer Isaac. Um, they have uh, invented a method, a, met a methodology, <coughs> to do this analysis. And they implemented it in which tool? You, you can guess now. No. <laughs> this is what we did afterwards. But they used Excel. <laughs> and afterwards I will show you a lot of screenshots of, of the MPS based tool and then you will immediately see what we see in many of the projects we are doing that when you start with a, with a big Excel sheet it's really hard to, to achieve consistency and to manage multiple versions and coordinate it among users and so on. And so this was what we found there. They were working with a big OEM in Germany they did the security analysis four years ago based on this Excel sheet. And there were lots of inconsistencies and things they couldn't do with this. So we not only introduced consistency by using MPS for this, but also added some more features which they couldn't do based on Excel. And yeah, the, what, the, what the tool will do is exactly what I mentioned before. So it, it supports system analysis and identification of security risks and also uh, improving the system design to apply these protective measures. So, special remark, the users are non-programmers, they are security experts. So you, you cannot uh, give them some, some editor to, to produce code. There is also a research project here which we use for, for funding the whole product development, which is quite nice. Uh, it's not the whole product development because we only get a part of this funded, but uh, after all it helps. And this research project has uh, started two years after the, the product development has started. The overall funding is 7 uh, million euros for all the partners. And as you can see, it's a mix of, of companies from the automotive space, but also Infineon is a, is a chip, uh, a, a silicon vendor and companies which are uh, specialized for the or specialized in the security domain and research institute. So this is the, the general idea. We have risks because of damages. Yeah. This is basically the same in safety. Yeah. And on the there are two axes here. One is the likelihood that the risk may happen, that a certain damage may happen. So it might be high uh, or, or low, so this is the axis on the, the y-axis. And there is a, another dimension which, are, which is the negative consequences. So something might be very likely, but if the consequences are very low, then I don't care. And also the other way around, something might, be, uh, might, might have very big consequences, like a, a piano falling on, onto your car, but the likelihood is, is very low, so I don't care either. Um, and so what we can do is multiply both, and then we get this, this red line, and we try to move all the risks into the acceptable zone. Because this is the zone where we don't care anymore. And how do we move these risks? By applying measures. So we, we have to find measures for every risk, so first identify risks, then apply measures, and then by that moving, moving the risk down in, the, in this I don't care zone. In the safety domain, we are done here. Because, so this slide is about safety. I, I put it into the security section because it helps understanding what we have to do. So if you look at this formula, then it's just the expected loss times the probability of an, of an accident occurring. So if one of them is very low, then the risk is also quite low. Uh, this is exactly this, how do you call it, hyperbola, or so, yeah. so this, uh, this red line. And now in, in the automotive space for safety, they have defined this, this automotive safety integrity levels, and they, are, they just define what measures have to be applied to, to move the risk into the acceptable zone. In security, it is a little bit harder because of this uh, Difference. So in, in safety, you have a statistical distribution if something will happen or not. 
In security, it just depends on someone who has the skills and can break into your system. So someone can find a, a hole and break in. So it, it depends on his skills, on that this guy is already already wants to break in and so on. Yeah. So it's a much more complex scenario. And this is why in security we are looking at not just at this multiplication, but at something more complex. And this is the overall scheme of this methodology uh, designed by this uh, Fraunhofer Institute. If you want to know more about this, there is a, a white paper about this. This is not publicly available, but if you ask me, I can give you a copy. Nice. So on the left-hand side, um, we will first describe the, the system under analysis. So something like I have a user with a, a laptop connected to a server. Simple setup. Or I have a car with various uh, control units and they are communicating via CAN network. And I will also describe here the, the data which is around. So I have a, the private data of the user is in this control unit and nobody should be able to access it, things like that. Um, then next we look at the protection needs, so which damages can actually occur. We don't look into how to make them occur, just at which can occur and what will be the actual damage. And then we look at the threats. This, this includes the hackers, the people looking at the security holes and then breaking in. And when we both analyze the protection needs and the threats, we can compute the risks. So that, let's look a little bit more inside here. So this is just the aspects of the, of the models we are looking at. So I already mentioned kind of the, the system design, the components, connections, also the data which is involved, but also the functions which the system uh, will do. So this is a screenshot from the, from the security analyst tool. <coughs> Um, and as you can see here, we, we need a way to define the architecture of the system starting with these component diagrams. Um, and the data flows from the system and so on. So this, this basically defines the system which we have. Um, actually, um, yeah, this, this tool should be is a product and should be used by non-programmer users. So what we are trying to do here is to do the, the, the have a usability experience as good as possible. So on the team there is a usability engineer and she looks into all the icons and how to use the tool and that all the, the user stories are uh, can be can be done quite nicely. And what we did here for improving the, the user experience of this graphical editor is to add some Java edX uh, like uh, language. So we we um, created a language, or actually a couple of languages, which use JavaFX for UI and which use the uh, are MPS languages. So this is an another screenshot uh, which shows the, the assignment of functions to the, the system components. So for a function like download service, uh, there, there is various kinds of data involved. <coughs> components and so on. So this is this is usually done by an architect uh, of the system or maybe also the, the security expert. And then you need to find out what is the actual interaction between the components in the system and sequence diagrams are quite nice for doing this. And this is usually done in the interview style so the security expert meets with an engineer and they talk about the system and the uh, uh, while they are talking, they, they will uh, put in the data for the sequence diagram and this will be used for the later security analysis. Yeah, we are using a plant, plant UML integration. Okay, let's move to the next box in the, uh, in the middle, uh, on the north side. So what, what we model here is which assets have to be secure. And what are the security goals to make them secure? So, something like we have a key store in our system and nobody should be able to access this key store from the outside. And from the security goals, we can also determine the damage level. So, what will, will it be bad if the, the, the key store is breached? 
Or will it be bad if the braking system of the car can be accessed from outside? Quite bad. And this is not only yes or no, but it's, it's also a, 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 a whole range of damage potentials. And there is also some, some formulas involved to aggregate these, these damage potentials along the system. And yeah, so this is an example screenshot of security goals. And what you can see here is yeah, the <coughs> example like avoid crashes, uh, damage potential very high, or integrity weather forecast for the current region, uh, damage potential very low, probably, not green, and so on. Availability of server response, and so you have, you have dozens of them. Then we can move on to the next step, which is looking at the possible threats, and as you might guess, Threads always relate to components and connections because these are the actual things you have in the system and which can be uh, hacked. And what we want to reason about is also the measures, the controls we will apply. So if we know someone could, uh, could hack the system via a given port, then we probably add a firewall rule for that. Or if we know someone could attack a channel, between two components, then we probably decide to encrypt the channel. And for encrypting the channel, we need to store a key somewhere, and then uh, we see it's an iterative process, because now we are adding something on the left-hand side <coughs> in, into the key store, and we also have to protect this one, and so the whole process has to be iterated. And now, when, after we, we decided about damage levels and the likelihoods of threats, we can do this computation I showed in the beginning and compare the risks. Yeah, and then you have in the tool you have lots of nice analysis graphs which show the interdependencies of all the aspects. Because the question you have after after all is why is this risk so important that I have to do something about it? And then you can look into the graph and the colors. And this requires some, uh, some experience with the tool and the method to, to quickly get the results here. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I, uh, what you can see here is this, this red line I showed you before on this graph from risk to accepted risks. This is the, the actual line in the tool where we go from very high risk to low risk depending on the damage potentials and the attack potential. And then the, the, the final thing I want to mention here is that the users of this tool don't want to don't want to start from scratch for every new project. This is why there are catalogs, catalogs of of threats, of possible controls, and also of typical damages or damage criteria, which are available with the tool and which can be tailored for the specific use case. So some automotive company will have different set of damage criteria and threats as a, as a bank. Okay, so now I've shown you the, the methodology and how the tool supports it. You saw a lot, a lot of different ESLs and notations here. And this is the very coarse architecture of the, of the tool we're using here. So, um, on the, on the one hand, we are using the typical MPS plus MPS extension stack with, with the IIT3 open source uh, uh, framework, and we added this Java FX stack on this uh, for this specific graphical editor. And this rapid FX and X diagrams are is a, is a little stack of uh, MPS languages which uh, use Java FX for rendering. Okay, summary for this security section. Um, so what you have seen is an RCP product based on, so built with MPS, uh, for security analysis experts, non-programmers. It's a quite complex model with lots of interdependencies, so the, the original approach using Excel was not so uh, successful or not suitable. Our emphasis here is clearly on usability. There's a usability engineer in the team. 
it's a friendly UI, lots of graphical views, and there's uh, tutorials inside the tool and so on. The main aspects here were modeling and analysis and also visualization. So there's no model transformation. Um, yeah, and I've shown you the, this integration of, of MTS and Java things. Let's move on to the second part. Now we talk about functional safety. And here, this is a new product, but it's, a, it's an exploration platform for uh, a research project. So here we have a research project with 8 million euro funding um, with a couple of partners. And lots of them are from the, the industrial sector, like, like Bosch Sensor Tech. They are, they are building these tilt and orientation sensors, in, which you have in most mobiles and in airbags and so on. And Infineon is also a partner here. Yeah, and the goal of this project, so the next slide, is to automate the insertion of safety software into functional software. Because usually what you do in, in, this, in this space or in the domains where safety is important is you um, have the functional software and then you know, okay, this component has to be more safe. Nothing should happen if the component fails. So you have to build into your system something which will ensure this. Um, are there examples here? So what you would do in this case is to duplicate this component or even have three instances of the component maybe on different hardware nodes, then they will compute the same thing and then you will compare the results. And if you have two of them, this is called dual modular redundancy, then you can only compare the, the results and find out if there is an error but not correct it. And if you have three of them, you can even correct errors because you can do a two out of three and then use this example. But you don't know at the same time if the third one has a different result and something is not working. Probably we want to to fix this on the next session uh, or after it landed. There are other uh, safety measures too. There's actually a whole list of 20 or 30 safety measures which we want to tackle in this project. CRC checking is the next one. It's also quite obvious. So you have some communication channel and you want to ensure that, that you find out if there's something wrong happening on the communication channel. And this can be done by the appliance here, some checking, and there are a lot of other measures. Um, another goal of this project is to apply these measures not only on code, but also on higher abstractions of the system. So a typical way of designing these kind of systems is to, to create a, a system model based on SysML, for example, and then we want to add redundancy already on that level. So not wait until code has been generated and then insert it into the code, but do it earlier. But the, the, so on the conceptual level, the, the same measures apply. You can do this redundancy thing on boxes or on code. And the goal in this project is to, to unify this, this uh, applying these measures. And I will show, show you how we do this. Now, for the next 20 minutes, if I talk about domains, I, I'm talking about model level code domain or even uh, intermediate representation domain, like bytecode. So it's not application domains as we usually use in the DSL world, but they are using it differently. So domains for the safety people is uh, the abstraction level, basically. So this is a very uh, detailed picture of uh, of the data flow in this in this project, I, I just want to point out. So on the on the blue side, there's the usual functional development. So the result of this is a system which can run, but it, which is not safe. And now, usually, this transition from functional to safe is being done by some safety engineer is looking at the code and inserting some lines to make it more safe. This is usually today's approach in automotive. So the cars you are driving, they are built like this. And then you cannot be sure did they introduce errors along this step? Is it sufficient? Uh, what kind of ideas led to the measures they, they added to the code? So this is not, not very nice. But now in this project we want to 
so somehow we find out what are the safety requirements. This is not the scope of the project. And then we want to, to annotate this functional software and say we want redundancy here, we want CRC check here, and so on. And then the final step should be fully automatic. So this is not in scope. There are various ways of analyzing a system. So in the security part, I talked a lot about analyzing the system. Here, this is explicitly not in scope. We are not doing FMER or fault tree analysis, although we did epitemic prototypes for, for building such things in, in tools. OK, why do we use MPS for this? Um, so first of all, we want to build examples of this safety weaving on different abstraction levels, on different kind of models. And the nice thing is, when we represent code in MPS, it's also a model. And so we have a unified view on the data we are manipulating. So when we apply this, this DM, EMR pattern for component models, it's quite similar to applying it on C code. Structurally, it's, it's quite different, but this is what we want to achieve, to have a unified view on all these kind of models. And then we also want to explore commonalities between domains, um, which means we want to uh, find out which parts are actually, can be actually handled the same way and where are the different. And for example, each of these patterns has to be configured. So for example, if I want to apply this redundancy pattern, it's not enough to say I want to apply it here, but I also have to say how do I do, how do I do the comparison between the two resulting values and to find out if they are the same or not, because if they are real values, for example, you cannot just compare them with an, with an equals operation. And then we also want to evaluate different model transformation technologies. I will come to that uh, a little bit later. And so didn't mention this here, um, this USF pattern here. So what we also want to define is a standard way of defining the patterns independent of the domain. So the same redundancy pattern should be usable for code, for models, and also for white code or intermediate representation. And USF is the DSL for describing this, but at the same time also a library of patterns which have been specified using this DSL. Uh, this is, MPS can be a, a nice test bed for, for developing this kind of uh, DSL describing patterns. This is the, the stack we are using here. Um, so we are again using the, the IT3 uh, project. Here we are also using core because we need component models which are represented there in a, in a nice way. And we are using Embedder Extensible C because we also want to manipulate C ASTs. We can do that. Yeah. And from <coughs> the, the extensions layer, we're using the interpreter framework and uh, the shadow model transformation framework. So, um, yeah, and, and lots of others, but these are the important ones. Okay, now we'll, we'll guide you through three application examples which can be done with this tool right now and then we look at the next steps because this research project is running until 2021 so we still have plenty of time so lots of plans so the, the first application is for the <coughs> component models so component models you find in various technical domains but also uh, enterprise domains um, in the technical domains we have UML2 or component diagrams, system L block models, we have the Autosar component model and there are lots of others. And here we are looking at one example of this component port model and how to apply these safety matters there. Um, what we have implemented there is this DMR and TMR patterns as an example, um, which duplicate or, or triplicate safety critical components and add another component which is a comparator or a voter. And here we, we use the standard MPS generator to implement it. So the patterns are hard coded, and you can, yeah, it's a little bit small probably, but um, on the left hand side you see a very simple example. So a sensor 
than an application which computes something with a sensor data and a UI which shows something. And what we want to achieve is to make this application, this computation safe. Uh, and then we press a button, run the transformation, and this is the result, which just duplicates the application component, adds this motor or comparator, does all the wiring, and then we have a new system. So the safety engineer now looks at the original functional model, adds some annotations, also adds some configuration, which is on the lower left side, and from the configuration and the input model, this will be computed. And so usually the input model is a system with hundreds of components, and then you just put the annotations where you want to do it, and then do this step. And as a next step, there would be maybe code generation or something else from here. So this was the first application. The second one, which is more interesting, is how to do this on the C code level. Because it's not so obvious in C code which parts of the code you want to duplicate and what the comparator looks like and what are the, these wires between components in C code. And so the, the, the challenge here is to find a mapping from C code into this block-like model which allows to apply the same pattern. And in order to get nearer to this goal, we implemented the same pattern on C ASTs from represented by, by Embedder, um, handle all the variable accesses properly, so this is one of the, the key points here. And here we, we use the, the sh uh, shadow models engine as transformation engine. We picked something else just because it's a research project and we have to check out all the, the, the available things. And this is an incremental model transformation engine. It's, it's briefly described here. So there's a DSL for describing transformation rules um, and the actual incremental transformation engine which uh, captures the user changes on the input model and puts these deltas into, into the engine and creates incremental updates on the output models. And results can be lifted back to the, to the input model which we didn't use here. So this is open source part of MPS extensions and I, I put one, one example transformation rule here from this DMR example. So the input here is a list of statements, of C statements, and the output is a, is a sublist from zero until to a specific point specified by this marker. Um, and this is just one little building block of the overall transformation. There is an upcoming paper um, Shadow models about shadow models, uh, uh, which we uh, publish at the SLE conference <coughs> next week. No, it's next, uh, the week after in, in Athens. I, I will show a, a demo of this in a minute. But first, I want to mention that that this weaving into C code has been actually implemented down to the hardware. So what we can do here, or what we did, is we have this this little uh, demo setup, which is a sensor, which can, can detect the tilt of the sensor, the orientation, and then in this LED matrix, one LED will, will light up, and if you tilt it, then this LED will go downwards. So you can, can move this LED around on this matrix, which is a very simple toy application, and this has been implemented with, uh, in C, uh, the code is publicly available, and then we did actually this annotation and then uh, applying the safety transformation and then we could rule out a, a class of the transient errors which might happen in the system just by applying this, this transformation. Um, we had a, a project evaluation in June in Berlin and this was the demo we, we could show there and uh, I think it would be quite nice to show after half of the, the project runtime that it actually can do something useful. <laughs> um, okay, the next few slides, I think I can uh, show the demo instead. It takes a while to transition from PowerPoint to PDF. 
Okay, so what you see here on the left side is the original C code. Uh, this is an uh, S embedder ESL. This is from this demo system. And on the right side you see the output of the shadow model transformation. And now it's the same because we didn't apply any annotations here. And you see, if you are familiar with embedded development, so you see the usual things of accessing uh, storage addresses and so on. And now I go down to the main loop. And what I already did was to annotate a block with this uh, save function, UPD. And uh, yeah, what happens here is to get the data from the center, this is outside <coughs> of, the, of the safe area, and then do a smoothing step and then move the, uh, the LED on the LED matrix and then render it. So send the data to the LED matrix device. What we want to achieve now, so now on the right hand side it's still the same, but the two are connected, so if I uh, change the left side, then the right, the right side also changes. Something's happening, but it's an identical transformation. What we didn't do yet is to mark the, the variable access which actually should be safe. And so what we want to do is that this is a, a, a read access here, so it gets, this is a struct, a C struct with uh, the coordination of the LED which should be switched on. So what we want to have is that this, this whole um, computation is safe. So it should be done in a redundant way and then we want to compare the two redundant computations and then abort if something's wrong. And the kind of, of, of faults we can detect here is if some memory addresses are corrupted. So now let's set a marker on this variable access. Now it's marked, and on the right hand side you now see that the, the annotation has vanished, but instead the code has changed. And so it replaced this annotation by some more code. And now if you look at this more closely, we can see there is still the get sensor data, and then the, this, this struct is being duplicated. The, the computation is done for the original struct, and then the same computation is done for the uh, for the duplicated struct, and then there is a section where the two values or the two structs are compared, and on some based on some condition, um, an error is uh, shown to the outside. And then this is a uh, some general I/O has been set here or can be set here, and then the system can be put into reset. This is all we can do here because we're only using this DMR pattern, and there's no. Um, yeah, sophisticated error handling in this system. Yeah, and then we are using the, the duplicated uh, variable to render it. Yeah. And what you can, can do now is, if I change the original code, then the transform code will also change, but now there are two sections which are changing because of the duplication. Um, and another thing which is interesting here is where do, does this compare, compare comparison code come from, and this is a, the configuration of this pattern, and I can jump here. So what you see here is this delta function, which does a comparison for let coordinate structs. And I also can change this, uh, maybe this, this, de uh, this delta uh, condition is wrong, so I can, can change that. So this model will be incrementally updated based on this pattern specification and also based on the original code. Okay, so this is the first part of the demo. And we can skip to the next few slides. <coughs> This is what I have shown you before. Um, yeah. Now let's move one step further. Um, 
What we want to achieve is not hard-coded transformation. So far you have seen one with MPS generators, one with shadow models, but they implement the same pattern but on different domains. One was this component graphical domain and one was the code domain. And now what we want to achieve in this project I mentioned at the beginning is to have something universal which can be applied on any domain uh, if we find a, a proper mapping. And so this is what we are working on here. So, so now we, we have defined a, a so-called USF block model which is just an abstraction for both domains. And the important thing is we, we now uh, want to specify the pattern in a way that it can be run on this more generic plot model and how do we specify patterns which transform models this is also a kind of transformation language which we need there um, so what we are designing there is another transformation language but not on generic meta models or concepts and, and properties and so on but on a specific subclass which are these block models and then we try to map all the domains <laughs> to this uh, block model meta. Now we are using not MPS generators and also not shadow models, but the interpreter framework, because we now have a ESL which describes the transformations, it describes the safety patterns as transformations, and we apply it by running it in, in the interpreter. Um, and so, the, this DMR redundancy transformation could look like this. So we have a couple of operations, so it's a quite imperative style language, and it gets a block as input and the two ports, and and then we have to, so what I've shown you before, uh, duplicate the block, add a comparator, rewire everything, and all these operations we now express with these uh, operations in this. And then we have built an, an interpreter for this language and we, now we can run this in a universal way if we manage to map this block port uh, concepts onto the domains. Yeah. This is now the, the final challenge. Um, and so the, the resulting picture looks like this. Um, this is, this is the, the second step I've shown you on C code. A concrete transformation implemented with shadow models resulting in Morse code, or the same for intermediate representation of LLVM or component models. So, this is a concrete implementation, and this here is on our abstract domain with something block like model. We are still discussing how this should look like in the end, um, and then the applied patterns. And now, the big question is how can we? connect both worlds. And there's a, a, a couple of ideas to do this. Um, but let me first show how this currently works. So what we have built so far is to have an example abstract domain language with its blocks and ports, and then the interpreter with which uh, applies the transformation. So the transformation looks like this. So this is the universal transformation for applying dual load redundancy. And this is the transformation for applying CRC checking on a channel. So it's a bit longer because it has several configuration options, but that's not the point now. And now this is an example language. So this is a this generic block language, again with this example we saw before, sensor, computation, actor, and then a system where sensor, computation, actor are instantiated and there are connections. And here we have a annotation to this generic uh, DMR pattern, and I can run it, and then all the gray stuff will be added or changed, and so we can see the, the compute block has been duplicated, um, there are new binaries, and there is a new block type named comparator type, which actually does the comparison. Uh, and we can do similar things with CRC and so on. Another the challenge is how to connect 
or how to replace this block language by the actual domain scheme. Um, and we have uh, four ideas right now, which we are starting to, to try out. The first one is the obvious. If we have some concrete domain, like the, the C language, we take the C language model and map it to our generic block model, do the transformation, and then map it back. This, I think this will work if we find the correct mappings. Uh, a, a nice challenge doing this is that this mapping from C code to this block model is not a static mapping. So how you do this actually depends on where the annotations are. This is a, a, a minor difficulty. Um, a second idea is to implement these um, these operations, these, these orange operations, in terms of the specific domain. So we implement a duplicate block operation by doing this statement list copy. Could be done, but it's also some work. But yeah, and then doing the second option would, would look like you, you use this this generic transformation as a script, running it on your domain, and the operations will do the the, whole of the work. The third idea is to write the interpreter not uh, against an API from the from this abstract domain with these blocks and ports, but against an interface, and behind the interface, there is the actual manipulation of the of the models. So something like uh, the interpreter wants to add another block, and it will be implemented by adding some new C function. So options two and three are quite similar. And the, the latest, hottest idea is to use higher order transformations. So this would look like having a, a model transformation which transforms these into these. This might not be the easiest one, but it's the most interesting one. In the <laughs> okay. So, um, to finalize this part about safety, so what I've shown you is a, a, a weaving tool, actually a tool platform for building this kind of tools for exploration and research. Um, we have various kinds of, of PSLs, block model language, the transformation language, and also mappings to things like embedder C and also component models. And the main aspect here is to apply these safety patterns by applying various transformations or higher order transformations. Um, we have been using MPS generators and shadow models and the interpreter framework. Um, yeah, and recently it has been, the, the project consortium has decided to use MPS as the reference platform for their further development. So now we are planning to do a training for all the other partners and so on. And up to now, the various partners are working with quite different technologies. Many are working with Eclipse technologies, but one of the partners is, is have, basically they have built a EMF with Python, completely from scratch. They have the whole tool world with generators, meta modeling, and so on, so they didn't use anything which was already there. And the, the goal is to also integrate all these various tool chains of the partners, and there we have uh, decided to, to define an eco format and to use this as an exchange format. Uh, this is the obvious thing to do, and in the, in the MPS world, we already have um, a meta model importer, exporter, and also model importer. So this will be quite easy to build after the, the languages have reached a stable state. We don't want to change so much after we do this uh, imports. Okay, so um, a few summary slides. So first of all, this is the merge of the two architecture uh, diagrams. Here we can see how the two things I've shown you uh, are located in this overall stack. There are lots of gray boxes which represent the applications you are building um, based on the, on the various levels of the stack. Um, and again, these are the tool dimensions I tried to explore here. 
So one is the scope. On the one hand, we saw the analysis of systems. On the other hand, the actual implementation, automatic implementation of measures. Then the, the goal in, in the one case, it's a, uh, the goal is to build a product for end users, for non-programmers. And on the other side, we want to build a research platform. Um, the key properties are on the, on the left side, ease of use, shiny UI. Everybody can, can use it quickly with, without much training. And on the other side, flexibility and the, the power of building new things. And, the, and resulting from this, the tool focus is uh, graphical editors and analysis on, on the security analyst tooling and model transformations in all kinds of styles in the Safe Online platform. Now to something completely different. This is the final slide. So the, um, the last few weeks, uh, JetBrains and, and ITNIS have, have worked out a common model for support contracts. Uh, this is the, the advertisement section. Um, and we just want to mention that something like this now exists. So the, the what you can do there is um, have a support contract only with one company and this will be famous and we will hand over part of the work, the, the hard part on the, the core framework uh, to JetBrains. And we finally found an agreement to do this together. If you want to, be, to know more about this, you can contact me or some of my colleagues uh, during this. Okay, thanks for your attention. For insert faults and then repeat this a million times and then count the, the detections and the recoveries and so on. And they're actually doing this and writing papers about this. But as we are not from this safety domain, uh, no, we, we are spectators there. But this is quite interesting because there's a whole range of different kinds of errors. Maybe a related question. Do you foresee tomorrow also deployment aspects? In the, in the mm, interesting question. Um, so currently we are looking at the software level, as you saw, but for mo many of the of the safety patterns, you have to regard the deployment. Like for watchdogs, you need some hardware support, and also for this redundancy thing, um, this will be much better if you put it on different cores. And so you have to talk about this deployment too. And uh, actually, in this pattern configuration I've shown on one or two of these slides, there are also properties where you can say, must run on different cores, or we need five cores for this, or some watchdog capabilities. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have non programmer users. We also use uh, CCS, I guess. Yes. They definitely need a first training on Git. <laughs> we had this recently at a customer site, and uh, yeah, I think this is necessary to know the the foundations. Um, I don't know how the how the security team does it right now, but definitely they are using Git under the hood, and so they have to learn at least the basics. I personally think it it won't work to try to hide the complexity somewhere. It, it, it below where uh, some UI, so it, yeah, just have to know the basics and then go with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're clever enough to use Excel. Um, you were talking about uh, duplicating blocks. And uh, as far as I understood, you run sort of simulation on a uh, duplicated block. 
and then compare results. It's not a simulation, it's the actual thing. Yeah, so it's uh, the question is uh, what exactly um, does it prevent? How does it make uh, the code more safe? So in, in, in the case I've shown you during the demo, it's running on the same core. Then the only thing it prevents is that some memory address or register <laughs> changes during execution. Yeah. Now this is kind of transient error. It, it detects uh, cosmic rays, right? Side effects, uh, side effects detection, or yeah, so um, side channel effects. So it's not side effects in the software engineering sense, but. Cosmic rays, or something happens that the memory address uh, switches. But um, if you put it on different cores, then you can also you're also safe against hardware faults. Because if one of the cores fails, then you still get the result from the other one. But it's a very simplified view. I can state here, but it's much more complex to to actually find out the impact of these measures and what they can prevent against. Uh, yeah, uh, you highlighted the usability aspects or the emphasis you put on. Did you do any um, evaluation of this so that you get any evidence more than anecdotal it is better? I don't know about doing something like this. Uh, this is the meta usability. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have a large enough number of anecdotal evidence that makes it statistically relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Java FX diagram stuff reusable really Currently, it's not open source, but we we can talk about this. So <laughs> yeah. the future in of principle, Java. we are open, but the, yeah, there was just no no interest yet. I saw. There seems to be a risk in Java FX. You don't know the future of Java FX. That's true. Yeah. It's going to be separated anyway in the 11 and uh, so you don't know but it is already and you don't know if you can reuse that yeah. but after all we have two layers of abstraction on top so we <laughs> 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 probably can move silence <laughs> okay any more questions okay so thank you